Beyond the Scope podcast presented by ND&D Productions. I am your host, Andy, senior year medical student. And here we continue the mission of sharing impactful stories from students, residents, and attendings of different medical professions while giving you an inside look into their lives, not just as healthcare workers, but the incredible people they are as well. But of course, this is also all about the things those years of medical training doesn't prepare you for, things that are beyond the scope of our practice. So that being said, let's introduce today's guest. And honestly, she doesn't need much of an introduction. Um, one of the OGs on YouTube's uh, medical community, this special creator's personal and heart-wrenching documentation of her life throughout med school has paved the way for others to share a less powdered up look into the life of a medical student. Inspiring millions with her stories and educating the world on the ups and downs of medical education, she truly has been one of the pioneers for the med student vlog genre on the platform, and she is now very soon turning the next page and entering a new chapter of life with two extra letters next to her name and a bright future as a baby mama doctor, and that's baby, comma, mama, or I don't know, baby mama combined too, I guess. That makes sense. Um, but anyways, I am so happy to welcome back to the channel and now to the Beyond the Scope podcast, one of my most favorite people in the world and a great friend over the past year, Rachel Southern. Oh my God, you almost, you? Me, I almost started crying, that introduction. <laughs> that made my heart feel so warm. Thank you, Andy. I'm so excited to be here. I'm feeling great and it is so good to see you, like I said. And um, yeah, I, I love what you're doing here. So I'm so excited. Thank you for having me. <laughs> you are very welcome. It's so good to see you as well. And I, I know it's it's been a while since we've talked at length. I think it's been like a year since I was in LA with you and Kojo. So mm -hmm. I, I know a lot has really progressed since then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so congratulations on matching. Uh, I have no idea when this episode is going to release. You may have started intern year at this point. I've been saying that for a lot of these oh episodes because, you know, I have a ways and sub eyes and all that stuff coming mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. um, but you are going to be fulfilling your dream of being an OBGYN. Yay. But before we kind of dive into how life has been going, I know I, I try to make decent intros for my guests. <laughs> um, could you brief, briefly introduce yourself uh, to like the three people watching that from my audience that don't know who you are and then um just throwing a fun question and things what's the biggest animal you think you could throw oh my god okay well first off i'm rachel southard i am a fourth year medical student um i'm in southern california for medical school born and raised in the bay area um yeah so i'm down here for med school and i just uh matched into my number one program for obstetrics and gynecology i am so excited um and then yeah i share my journey as a med student on youtube and i do plan to continue uploading as a resident it'll be tough but i have gotten so many requests to do so and it would bring me um, nothing but joy to be able to do that. So that's me. Uh, the biggest animal that I could throw. Mm, I wanted to be really ambitious and say something crazy, but realistically, that was the question, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, why am I thinking baby elephants? There's no way. There's no way. <laughs> I How dense is a baby elephant? Probably like tons of pounds, to be honest. Um, I'm thinking maybe like a little pig. I don't know. Okay. I'm That's yeah. Cool. I'm thinking it's kind of like a kettlebell, like a small little <laughs> pot belly pig. But I would never throw an animal because I love animals. But if we had to, it would be maybe like a little pot belly pig because it's very kettlebell esque. Pot belly pig. That's. I, I saw that question in one of my favorite YouTubers' videos when he was, like, street interviewing people. And I was like, yeah. you know what? Added to the repertoire. I like it. That That's definitely <laughs> got me thinking for a second there. Alrighty. So, obviously, I, I got to save that for, like, breaking the ice. But I don't think there's any any problem here. Um, so, um, okay. Let's kind of get into the meat of things. You're, like, at the time of recording this literally a couple weeks post match day. So, mm. of course, I, fingers crossed, uh, have a year <laughs> until that moment. Mm -hmm. So 
take me through match day. Like, I know med school schools all do it a little different. How was yours? Okay, so do you want to talk about match day, which was the Friday where I, where I find out where I matched, or the Monday as well, where we find out if you matched? Ooh. Both of those are two separate beasts, so let's go go into both. Okay, so the first one, so if you guys don't know, match week is a huge week for med students where we find out if we match, we find out on the Monday um, if you match to a program, and then on the Friday of that same week, you find out where you matched, if you matched. <laughs> um, so it is a really crazy week to look forward to. And I remember the fourth years when I was a third year and they were coming up on this big week and they were so nervous and I never understood why I didn't, I could not feel their feelings and I just saw what a nervous wreck they were. And so I was like, okay, that'll be me next year. And sure enough, the time has flown so fast to, you know, if, uh, two weeks ago or so when, or I think it was last week, it was last. No, I don't even know. Was it last Oh, I think it was 17? last week. I think it was last week. I think oh, so. Man. I've been all over the place since that happened, so I don't even know what Same. day. Okay, anyway, so it was last week, I think. So I, um, yeah, that Monday, it was just like, I don't know. I, I documented that whole moment and the amount of relief that I got when I opened that email saying that you matched like I could not sleep the night before and it was just like everything that I've ever done has come down to this moment and what was is really scary about this process is that you can be the most perfect candidate ever and not match and that is what's so scary about it there's a huge possibility that I would not have matched um and it is just a matter of this crazy algorithm that determines your life kind of so um there's a lot of pressure on that and you know you have no control and you just have to accept what it is uh, so that monday i opened it and and i had like a huge sense of relief i was like wow i have a job when i graduate medical school <laughs> um i don't have to soap or anything like that and my heart goes out to the people who didn't match um and had to deal with that whole soap process that's another beast but um leading up to friday so those days like tuesday wednesday thursday i was so sick to my stomach like it was just terrible i was i don't know i was so sick and i was just like i i want to match my number one and if it's not my number one i don't know what i'm gonna do and like i said you have no control over these things and so I just had to kind of wait for time to pass. And that night I hardly slept at all, but I kept trying to keep sleeping so time could pass and I wouldn't sit here and twiddle my thumbs waiting for, I think it was nine o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Yeah, on Friday. And um, I had my parents here and it was a big moment for all of us just because like I'm a first gen college graduate and all of that stuff. So it was just a big moment to be able to get to this point. And um, I opened that that email and shared the news with my parents. And God, I cried so much. <laughs> like, I'm such a big crybaby. I'm about to release a video tomorrow of this whole match. Or by the time this is released, it'll already have been out, obviously. Yeah. But um, God, I cried like that whole video just because it's such an emotional roller coaster. But um, I don't know. Yeah, it's crazy. That was just a long way to say that it is very nerve wracking. And it is... It's a big moment and it's, it's, I'm happy that it worked out the way I wanted it to. Yeah. And I I guess from a like non fourth year perspective, it's been interesting because like I had tons of friends in the like upper classes when I was an M1 and M2 and, you know, watching their match day and being there for them was so surreal. And I was so excited for them in those two years, but I felt like this year was different. Um, I, well, one, I was live streaming their match day because I was literally taking a practice MVME for step two on their match day. Um, but I think it was anxiety was more of an, an emotion, um, than like celebration, even though I really wanted to, um, and that could have been contextual with like step two being so close. I don't know if that was how you felt as a third year too. Yeah, it was just, I I felt kind of blind to their emotions. Like I was stressed out and anxious for the fourth years at the time. But but yeah, I think it was a, a compounding of knowing that I, you know, I'm still on rotations. I still have to do step two. I still have to apply to residency and do all of it. Like, I was like, wow, I have so much ahead of me just to get to this week in time. 
but it really like Andy, it flies by so fast. It'll be here before you know it. And that it's, it's terrifying, but I mean, putting in the work now and it'll, it'll, it all pays off eventually. I, I definitely, I definitely hope so. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, you know, you've, you've addressed in your videos and you kind of touched on it a little earlier that, you know, it's, it's an unfair system, period. There's no debate about it. Um, the fact that there are many, many, many very qualified, if not overqualified, uh, applicants for residency positions that don't get it every year. That's just an injustice to healthcare. It's an injustice to patients. Um, and, like, no no other industry does this. Like, no. what, what is this really weird sorority match system that we got going on? Um, and, like, you know, you see all these videos on TikTok of people opening up these letters with such like, immense relief. And then you get people from not in medicine going, like, how are you guys not crippled by anxiety and depression? And then you get other creators going, like, oh, yeah, we definitely are. <laughs> right. Right. I agree. And I saw a video recently where it's like, oh, these these medical students are so excited. They open this letter to match and get a job. I'm going to say it that is paying less than minimum wage in the United mm -hmm. States, basically. And it is just it's so it's such a twisted thing where we deal with even as med students so much pain in didactics or clinical clinical rotations, all of that, just mental stress and I don't know, so much distress in this whole process and it never ends. You're always being put through the ringer and we get excited over these big moments that are actually, when you think about it, they're, it's a disgusting process, the way that match happens, um, the way that residents are paid and treated. It's just, it's getting better, but it's still, there's nowhere near where it really should be um, as you know, physicians in the United States. Yeah, we, we have a lot lot to go. Um, of course, as we grow as physicians, most likely going to be the generation to take those first steps in making that change. And that is a whole rabbit hole that I can go down that we will not go down on this podcast. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of great videos um, on the match process by Med School Insider, friend Kevin Jubal, and like a ton of other people. But we're going to talk about the positives here yeah, and the that. more celebratory point. Um, so kind of getting to match day as far as like figuring out where you're going um i know there's multiple ways of doing it uh i've seen some people do it like private at their home some do a big ceremony and then kind of everybody opens it opens the envelope all at once and then some go on stage and announce it on a mic i think i saw a video of tcu apparently they give them a football with like <sighs> like printed their name their class oh and then like where they match i think that's awesome but is there a format you think you would have preferred and how did you guys do it? I know it was like nine, nine o'clock in the morning for California yeah. time. We had, we did have an option to go to the ceremony at this big hotel nearby um, where we would all open our letters together and we have these little signs where you can write it on and then we'd go on stage and talk about it uh, or not talk about it to and announce to everyone. And it was live streamed on YouTube and everything like that. Um, I, of course I wish that I, I part of me wishes that I would have gone. Um, there's like many components or reasons why I didn't. One was that um, I wanted to be able to, it's so bad, but I wanted to film the moment and I didn't want to worry about so many different people in the background because obviously as content creators, these are moments that are, we're like, oh my gosh, this has to be recorded. It just has to be. So I, I wanted to make sure I was in my home where my lighting is good and I have all of my equipment. It's so gross that I think about this stuff, but I wanted to share the moment with my parents and just have it be like a special intimate moment. Um, and another reason was that if I didn't match my number one, I, I'm going to be honest, I would have been pissed. And so I didn't want to be around people that were celebrating if I wasn't able to celebrate. And I don't know if that's selfish, but it's just more of, I, I wanted to be able to process it on my own and not be in everyone's face about it. Um, and then lastly, <laughs> I hate that this is a thing, but um, since it was being live streamed, I did not want, I know that some of my subscribers and they're all so wonderful and lovely, but I know that some of them know which school I go to and they were watching, looking for me to have announced, hey, I went, I matched to this program and I'm really trying to keep it under wraps where I match just because of privacy and safety because of mm -hmm. You know, I've had that crazy stalker, and so I'm just yeah. trying to protect myself, and I'm, I just don't want, I don't, 
want it to like get out there. I know people know, some people know, but um, if I can keep it as private as possible, I would definitely like to do that. So um, as much as I, I would have liked to celebrate in a huge group um, or something like that, I, I did like being able to have the option of staying home with just my parents. Yeah. And like guys listening, watching, and girls, uh, be nice to Rachel. Come on. <laughs> Um, and, and obviously we, we had this talk to, uh, before we started recording and like, you know, being on the internet and then like going into a very intimate field, like Obi-Gyan just like adds layer upon layer of kind of like weirdness in, for lack of a better word, <laughs> um, to the equation. So I completely get it. And honestly, it's even valid if, if you're not a content creator, um, I, <laughs> I had a couple friends um, have this conversation seeing like these big schools doing the get up in front of everybody and announce it on the mic. I think that's horrific. Yeah. I I think that is ridiculous. And, you know, feel free in the comments to share your own opinion. But like at the end of the day, it is like it's where you're going to work and train. It's, you know, a play, it's a time to celebrate with your family. And like you said it's a time to kind of process all those emotions that like it's only going to affect you so why like bring all these strangers faces and names to it and it's super ironic saying that like being on youtube Um, right right i know (laughs) but like you know it's one of those pick your battles things like this is a very big moment and you know i i know there there's kind of a movement too for people to say like uh, don't you don't have to say if you match your number one or or not um just it's like right. there's some people that that don't and like you said they right. they may process that in a very difficult manner mm-hmm. um and i i have friends that thankfully in 23 they couples match and they all went to the same place but there have oh. been horror stories of people couples matching to like different place in the world so imagine those people on match day and like making them go in front of a mic and like announce that just like right. that's cruel right i think it's very it can be a really taboo thing and a lot of things that i noticed that in medical school it, like sharing your scores or sharing where yeah. you're auditioning at where you got interviews at um it's a very private and i don't know why the nature is like that maybe it's because we all have a little bit of competitiveness in us where we want to you know just kind of <laughs> do our thing and I don't know, pave our own ways on, on our own, but it's, I don't know if it's that, if it has to do with that, or if it's just being scared of announcing it to the world and then being wrong or not getting what you wanted. And so, yeah, I think that safety is a huge thing, um, with sharing whether you're a content creator or not. Um, and then I know that with, being a content creator, like this is the territory that we're in where yes, your stuff's online, but there are some things that we'd like to keep private. Um, and then where was I going with this? <laughs> um, the wait, Andy, help me out. Where were we going? Um, Sorry, I think just part, <laughs> obviously, I, I think just like the preference of, you know, how people arrange oh, yeah, match day. Okay. Got it. So can I jump back in? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and then, so then announcing whether it's your number one or not, I kind of went back and forth with announcing like, Hey, this is my, I, my number one, but it's mainly for, I'm so proud like to have matched with, for, with my number one. And I've gotten that, that residency. <laughs> if, obviously if I didn't match number one, I would not have said that, but, um, I know it, it kind of pulls on my heartstrings a little bit with, sharing that information because I do know so many people and and some of my best friends didn't match their number one and they're going through it still. And I'm checking in with them every day. And part of me, I'm like sharing all this on the internet, but then also I'm just like, my heart hurts for these people because if I were in their position, I don't know how I would be processing it. And so it's really trying to find this fine line of respecting everyone and how they feel, but also being proud of your accomplishments. Like we still should be able to celebrate. And I know that so many people have been rooting for me this whole time. And I want to share enough to where we can all celebrate and be like happy for each other. Um, but then also respecting how other people feel and, and how they're processing it. Yeah. And it, that's, that is a fantastic way to put it. Um, is again, it, even 
outside of the context of being a content creator, like even if you're just sharing on your personal Facebook, Instagram, whatever, like there are people that follow you probably from your med school class or others. And, you know, it it's this weird mix of celebrating and then comforting those right. around you, which like <laughs> ironically is medicine mm-hmm. <laughs> in a right. nutshell. Right. You know, like trying to be strong for other people while still finding a way to celebrate the small victories in your own life to keep you sane. Right. Um, and that is match day. Definitely. And my, something that I've been doing lately, cause there are, like I said, a lot of my close friends who didn't match their number one. And I've been trying to do this thing, you know, ever since match day was that if I think about them, even for a moment in the day, just like if, they pop into my head because they do. And I have, I have a big heart and I care for my people. And so the second that I think about them, I shoot them a text and I don't I don't wait because I'll forget. And so if you're in these positions where if you do have friends that are, you know, going through it, whether it is related to match day or related to something else, if you're thinking about someone, let them know and, and send them something because people have done that for me when I'm going through a hard time and you have no idea how much it actually helps you to get a good text throughout the day or to get someone sending you a quote of something that reminds them of you or some sort of strength thing. I don't know, something like that. And so lately yeah. I've been doing that, um, not just around match stuff, but if I'm thinking about someone, they're going through a hard time, I always just text them like, hey, I'm thinking about you and send them something nice because it, it does change someone's day, even if it's just a temporary um, change in their day. But do that, <laughs> please. <laughs> That's good. Uh, that's good words of advice. I, I think everybody needs to hear that. Mm-hmm. Um, OK, so now after match. Yes. A lot of people wonder, what are med students doing after match? <laughs> what, what, what are we even doing? Why are we paying tuition for most of fourth year? Don't get me started, Andy. Okay. <laughs> because I'm not doing anything. I'm not. I just finished my last rotation, my last day of my last rotation of medical school yesterday. It's March 23rd. And now what? Now what am I supposed to do? <laughs> I, I That's my question. What are you doing? In mid-May, uh, for someone who likes structured discipline, having a routine, this is going to be the most chaotic time I- mentally in my life just because I'm like, what am I supposed to do? I went to yoga this morning at 5.30. So I can this have is... like, and so like I'm scheduling out my day. So I feel like I have some sort of structure. This is the most doing? type A med student response ever. <laughs> So disgusting. I just can't not because you either get me when I'm type A neurotic schedule down to a T or I'm so lazy I will not leave my bed. You know? Like I won't even get coffee and, and I I'm glued to my bed. And so it's it's one or the other. You're never gonna get in between. So I think during this time I know people travel. Um, I don't have a passport and as much as I would love to travel the world or whatever right now, that also seems very stressful. It seems very expensive. And so I think during this time, I'm going to figure out where I'm going to live um, because most residencies, they start July 1st or whatever, but most of them actually start mid-June because you have orientation. So you have to already be in that area yeah. um, by at least June 1st, I want to say, to be safe. So um, I'm going to work on finding a place and... I don't know. I guess doing mini trips potentially over to you. Um, so, yeah. Visit, so, visit Georgia. I visit know, Augusta. I know. We don't have much here besides the Masters, but it's it's. That's fun. okay. <laughs> you have good people, I'm sure. Um, shout out to your to your friends. Uh, <laughs> hey, Tanner, Tyler. Tanner and Tyler. I hey. know you're watching and listening. What's up? <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. And this is kind of a funny question. What are words of advice to attendings and residents with matched med students on their service? Because I literally got off a phone call with an M4 that's like, yeah, I just came from um, my ED shift. I'm like, bro, you're matched. And like matching a very competitive specialty. Like I, I would, I would literally be a brick. Like, right. I like, I, I know I don't want to be and I shouldn't be, but like, Everybody, all the residents and attendings have gone through this process. Like, they know how much of, like, a relief, but also just a senioritis hit it is. Mm-hmm. Like, what, did, what would be your advice? 
Well, I know that that senioritis hit me so long ago. Um, so, oh. Yeah, it hit so long ago. And I have been I feeling like a brick uh, since probably February. So um, I, I guess my advice to them is it's hard to say as a med student because I'm like, just let them go or like be li like light on them. Let them have a half day, um, stuff like that. But uh, yeah, if, if it's not their specialty that they want to be in, I would say let them go. Like personally, if I had the option to let my med student go after they matched, I'd be like, never come back. Like, please go <laughs> celebrate and live your life. Life never is so back. short, you know, like, yeah, yeah, never come back. Like, please leave and go outside. Go see the sun before you won't see it again. Um, go hug your parents or your dog or whatever it is and enjoy the time that you have now because the clock is ticking to where we start working that 80 hours a week and get that tiny little paycheck. Oh, man, you're going to be a great attending. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Come rotate with me when I'm an attending. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. And now this is an interesting question, and this is getting close to – we actually did a little, like, IG poll Q&A thing. So near the end, we'll fast-fire some of these uh, questions. Okay. But one thing I want to touch on, especially pertinent to me um, going into this match cycle, you know, we've talked at, at length, obviously, about, like, you and I can't really hide our internet presence anymore for from residency programs. Mm -hmm. um, but I know whereas a lot of people will see that as a bad thing, I definitely think that the work you have done has a far greater reach and impact than any singular case report ever published. No. Academia will, like, academia will probably argue with me there. But, like... From a creative mindset, I know how important research is and everything, but um, like everybody will have it. Um, this is this is something different. I'm just curious, how was the interaction between like your YouTube stuff and then PD slash residents during your aways and interviews? Because you know mm -hmm. it's definitely a talk a talking point. I know it will be most likely for me. Um, so I, I'd love to hear what you kind of experienced. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you asked because I get a lot of questions about this and I think it is something to talk about. Um, and I think that if you are deciding to create content or anything you post online, whether it's to a small audience of 50 people or thousands of people, you have to be very aware of what you're posting because it's there forever and anyone can pull it back. And so it's going to follow you the rest of your life. So you have to be very strategic with what you post obviously like th that goes without saying but um it's good to be reminded about that but when i was starting this whole journey i knew that okay i'm gonna eventually apply to residency and this is gonna be this platform that i have that that i'm gonna have to show everyone because we can't hide like you said so um i was very i want to say that on my aways i was not very forward with it i wouldn't really show that i was filming at all and I would keep it kind of private just because you don't know how it's going to rub people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted them to see me as a med student and not as someone who likes to create content on the side. Um, however, people do know um, my channel in the hospital settings, at least like I run into a lot of nurses and stuff like that. That'll stop me and say like, hey, Rachel, you watch your channel and people over here attendings over like overhear that and residents will even have known who I was when I got there. And they're like, oh my God, we're so excited. And luckily it's been really good feedback. Um, and even through my interviews and, and I put it on my residency application, I did disguise it a little bit um, in the sense I didn't outwardly say I'm on YouTube, like this is my employment. I just said Google LLC, cause technically it's under Google. Um, and then, so then I would, then I discussed like what that meant. Uh, so it, has been uh, a blessing in disguise because people people really liked it and uh, something that i wanted to hide and kind of be embarrassed about is actually something that i i'm really proud of and i've done x y and z and i've made a difference in in at least like a few people's lives or um whatever it is and so i like to talk about it and everyone has been really positive um in their in their feedback and so like hey we've watched some of your videos and we really like what you're doing um so the opposite side of that is that if you're posting content that even can question, like, uh, strike someone a certain way, even, I, I hate to say it, but, like, even, like, TikTok dances and stuff like that, you never mm -hmm. know. You never know. Like, it can strike someone a very wrong way. Um, and it, 
I don't know. So my, my whole rule of thumb with posting is that if I have to double think about what I'm saying, if I'm editing something or whatever it is, then I should not include it. Even if it's a certain way I say something, if it's a certain, like even clothing that I'm wearing sometimes, I just, not that I dress provocatively, but if it even has a hint of that, that someone can take the wrong way, then I just say like, no, let's keep it safe. Let's keep it appropriate, um, educational, um, positive. So I don't know. That was a very long ramble, but that's essentially, it's been a positive thing. Yeah. It, it's been a positive overall. And like, I, I think the biggest thing that, you know, going back, I want to clear up the statement with the case report thing. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> the reason why I say that, and this is kind of going back to your misinterpretation thing, is I don't want people to misinterpret it is that right. you can publish a case report, right? Mm-hmm. But the ability to it could be the best thing in the world, the most novel disease procedure complication out there. But unless it gets read, right, it will have no impact. Right. And where I think like social media and particularly YouTube has the potential to have. And that's why like I, I love the content that I make and it almost, you know, goes on the edge of, med education where it's like exposing a lot of pre-meds and med students to these different specialties um i have actually started doing some more instructional formal type stuff especially mm-hmm. within surgical procedures even though right. those are all unlisted because youtube hates blood and gore um but like the reason why your platform is impactful and i think anybody who decides to go on social media is it brings eyes to the work that you do academically. And that's something that, you know, I've been working a lot within my own departments and hopefully in residency will help to cultivate is that like we can make great work, but that great work will go unnoticed unless we bring this like marketing aspect to it, which is right. where, you know, all these years, all the hours, editing, filming, uploading, that's, yeah. that's the stuff that really, you know, will make an impact. Uh, I, I think the long run. Right. I agree. And um, I think that something that I tried to think about with content creating and stuff like that is that I'm always tra- asking myself, what am I bringing to the table? Because I think there's so much content out there. Everyone is a content creator. It's wonderful. But as everyone asking, what are they bringing to the table? How can we make our social media usage good for for people if they're going to be on it they everyone has a phone everyone has these certain apps how can we make it worthwhile in the sense that people can take your content and grow or learn something from it or gain a new perspective um and so i think that you know any advice for people who are wanting to do this please constantly ask yourself what are you bringing to the table i know that some of my subscribers will say rachel we don't care if you're eating from a bowl of cereal like a bowl of cereal uh for 20 minutes like we will watch it (laughs) But I, as much as I would love to sit there and eat a bowl of cereal for you guys, I want to bring <laughs> substance to the internet because there's yeah. this internet's polluted with so much crap sometimes. So, you mm-hmm. know, bring something, bring something, offer something for people to learn from or, you know, like I said, gain some sort of growth. Yeah. I, I think purpose, You again, this is a whole other rabbit hole that we can go down, but, you know, at, Everybody that comes to me like wanting to start a channel or wanting to get involved, especially with a background in medicine, you know, the first thing I always tell them is, why are you doing this? What is what is your purpose? Um, If it's to get monetization, if it's to get famous, get some sort of clout, and especially if it's to do medicine less, you've already failed. Right. Right. I agree. Like that, that's just it period. That's how I think people within med school should approach social media and getting involved in media creation. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, it's so easy to view it as a way to make a quick buck and especially like add some sort of like artificial security, be like, oh yeah, backup plan, fall, fall back. I can quit medicine one day. It, it, It should never be like that and if that's your goal why did you why did you go to med school you know like you you should you should be here because you want to be here um uh, but yeah i i think like one question to wrap it up 
for you? Like, reflect on this time, all those hours editing, filming, uploading over the past, like, four plus years, right? Mm-hmm. You think it's been worth it? Absolutely. I would, I can't, I can't see myself not doing this. And although I didn't see myself in this position four years ago, I am so happy that it all happened. It's all worth it. And like I said, I'd, I'd do it over again if I had to. Yeah. Uh, that's the answer that I knew would come out. Yay. All right. So now we're getting to the kind of med school Q&A portion. Okay. I've assembled some questions from both uh, your Instagram as well as mine. Um, we got a lot, a lot of questions. Um, kind of selected a few. We'll try to keep these like quick fire answers. Okay. So maybe okay. like a paragraph or less. I won't. So, all right. First one. As an incoming uh, M1, best piece of advice for surviving year one. Um, coffee, a support system, and checking in with yourself, um, asking yourself if you're okay and recognizing if you're not okay, take that day off. Your study work will be there when you come back. Yeah. Uh, my advice is, um, pace yourself, do a little bit, a little bit every day. It goes a long way instead of cramming, um, community, mm-hmm. find people to, you know, work with and at some points commiserate with. Uh, that's <laughs> misery what's gonna get you through. <laughs> yep all right uh i guess this is for both of us uh how have you two managed med school and social media so well oh discipline having a schedule for yourself um well at least at least that worked for me i knew that sundays are my editing day and i'd film throughout the week um, and sticking to that that tight schedule, um, and then enjoying what you love. I enjoy studying. I enjoy learning medicine, and then I also really enjoy YouTube. And so, if there was any moment where I didn't find joy in doing YouTube or something like that, then yeah, I would not upload a video that week. But I did not. I haven't missed many weeks, so <laughs> I've clearly been keeping this balance because I enjoy it, and it helps me keep going. What about yeah. you, Andy? Um. I definitely say scheduling and planning uh, is super key. I would always figure out, all right, when are the weeks that are interesting? When can I film? I have in my head an idea of what shots I need. Um, And this is from like, I guess, like just a former, or not former, formal, like filmmaking mind. Right. That's just like, I know what shots I want. I need to figure out when's the best time to get them. When I, when I can get them. And then how to string together a story. So like really for a lot of my vlogs, the story is already in my head. It's just like getting shots to fill into the outline and then making it look pretty. Right. Um, And then even right now, like I have three weeks between when I finish step two and when I start my sub eye. Mm -hmm. And I'm like grinding out videos, podcasts. I'm Mm -hmm. like traveling to do interviews, doing collabs and stuff. And so that gives me the ability to when I need to step away from the camera and everything because med student first, <laughs> I still have things to roll out um, because I, as you have kept a fairly consistent um, weekly upload schedule, I've been fairly consistent for the past yeah. like year and a half, I would say. I haven't, mm-hmm. I also haven't missed many weeks. Uh, but that's that's what it takes. A lot of planning, a lot of scheduling in advance. And like, believe me when I say a lot of these interviews that I do are like six plus months. In planning. <laughs> um, I believe it. Yeah. But yeah, that, that's that's how we do it. Uh, I guess question for you, because I know the answer for me. Are you still studying? <laughs> Oh my God, no, (laughs) no, I have not really studied hardly at all. Um, I do dabble into some of just rebrushing up on some ob guide stuff. Um, But other than that, I really have not studied at all. I dipped into some true learn questions for level three, because I'm going to have to take that board in probably a year or so. But why? Why are you doing that now? Because I'm crazy. <laughs> I don't oh, know. I, I, no. What else am I going to do? I can only go to go yoga like one time a day. Sleep. And sleep. Mindlessly whatever. scroll on TikTok. Go for a walk. I have downloaded TikTok again because I was locked out for so long. And th- that app is so toxic because I scroll for so long. I have arthritis in my thumb from going like <laughs> this. It's terrible. <laughs> I can't. But it's a nice time passer. I'm still studying. <laughs> I have my sub eye in a ways. I I have to study. This um, will be soon. 
Who do you think would win in a fight, a pediatrician or a lab scientist? <gasps> oh, my God. Ooh. I'm going to say pediatrician. They can wrangle kids if they need. You know, when putting the otoscope in a, ch- in a child's ear, you know how crazy. you like, you, how much you, it's. No, I think that the pediatrician could. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wrangle little humans. So. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. Thigh or chest tattoos. <laughs> Oh, probably thigh. I prefer th- thigh just because it can be hidden better. Like a chest tattoo. Is some- does someone you know have a chest tattoo that I'm like? I'm not going to say. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Is someone out of the running? Why am, okay. why am I- no, I shouldn't have laughed. They, they- Look, these are real questions that got, okay. got oh submitted. Oh, my God. I feel like I know Instagram. who might have asked that. One of your friends or something. Um, <laughs> Anyways, um, no, right, like, you answer the question. Wait, what was that? You answer the question. <laughs> Shoot. Okay. Uh, <laughs> back to our regularly programmed scheduling. <laughs> um, advice for low GPA slash extensive experience applicant. I guess for med school. Wait, low GPA? I, I don't know what extensive experience applicant means. Maybe like lacking extensive experience. Hmm. Okay. Uh, man, I want to say that you're, you're more than your scores, um, and numbers that you have in your application. And as much as that is true, it's also obviously a reality you have to face if you have low scores, because a lot of the time that's, what's going to be, what gets you through the door is like the score that you have. Um, it's unfortunate, but if you know that you have a weak point in your application, then you need to build up the rest um, and be ready to explain why you have a low GPA if, if someone asks you in an interview. Okay. Great advice. Um, I don't know. I, I can't really speak to that too much just because I was part of an accelerated program. So that's why I kind of let you take oh, the reins on that. Um, all right. Next. I take my MCAT tomorrow. Any advice for test day feels? Oh, my goodness. Um well, take a deep breath and relax. My biggest thing that I like to do before my exams, um, especially like one of those uh, standardized type exams, is going to the bathroom and doing the superhero pose in front of the mirror and smiling at yourself and telling yourself you can do it. It's very empowering. I think they've done studies on it. We're doing like this pose and like puffing your chest out and putting your chin up and telling yourself you can do it. Um, it does impact your performance in a positive way. So doing that helps. Um, and then during your breaks, drink your water. All that, do some jumping jacks. Um, you got this. My advice just it's trust in your gut. You yeah. you study hard for it. The knowledge is in there. Just right. gotta just gotta get it out. Um right. and, and that's really my biggest tip. Mm-hmm. Um okay. How, what was your lowest moment in med school? Oh my gosh. Um man, we could get really low and deep. But I think let's, let's, just, let's keep it surface. Yeah, some trigger warning, so I won't go there. Um, my lowest moment in med school. Um, I can't think of one in particular that I would like to share, but I think as a whole, second year was probably my lowest year of medical school in the sense that um, that was during the peak of COVID. So yeah. um, if you think about it, we're locked in our rooms, studying for 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, We can't go to the gym because everything's closed. We can't go out and do anything. Everyone, no one was out of their house. Like even on the streets, you know, here in Southern California, a very populated area, it was a ghost town and it was very isolating, very depressing time to never go really outside and to learn a different way of life, a different way to get exercise, a different way to have wellness um, while having this really rigorous curriculum and having boards right after second year, it was a really awful time. And I would never, I couldn't relive that year again. Cause I don't know if I would make it through. It was very, really tough. Yeah. Mine's mine's with 10,000% the three months of dedicated for like, I just think taking step one, all your shelves and step two back to back to back, just mm-hmm. most likely my video about this experience will, will be out by the time this, this podcast goes up. But like, I would recommend everybody just take step one before um, you do your clerkships because like doing all three of those back to back to back is 
an experience that mm. I would not do again. And mm-hmm. I think like the class of 2024, at least for my school, uh, would probably uh, testify to that. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. These next two are going to be for you. Okay. And you only. Uh, Obi-Gan is known for having poor work-life balance and a high burnout rate. How will you fight this? Hmm. Um, yes, I'm very aware of that. I know it's not a lifestyle that's very conducive to having a life <laughs> outside. Um, and for someone who wants to be a mama bear one day, it is something that I've definitely thought about. But honestly, I could not see myself doing anything else. So there was really no other option. And I think that from right now, the amount of joy that I have being on L and D and doing all of the OB guy related stuff, it brings me so much joy that it'll be worth it. Um, you know, like do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. That whole quote thing, I think mm-hmm. stands very true, but, um, I guess that'll be something that I am going to have to work through because I don't, I don't really know what the lifestyle is going to be like once I get there. Like I did my auditions and as much as that modeled what it would be like as a resident, it's still, not the real thing. And so I think that that's something I, I have no idea how I'm going to to deal with it. And it's something that I will share with you on my YouTube channel for how I'm getting through it, because I know that'll be a challenge, but I'm excited for it. And I don't, I'm not very, yeah, fearful of it. So TBD. Yes. Um, all right. Another one just for you. Why was your number one, your number one? Oh my goodness, the people, they made it for me. The second that I, I mean, it was my number one because it's beautiful hospital, beautiful um, area, the really, like really good, well-rounded training in in certain programs. Like they have different things. Um, I don't know, different features that some of them I didn't like. This one had everything that I liked. And then, so when I got there for my audition, the people were incredible and I was like, oh my gosh, I feel like these people are my family and I've only known them for a short short amount of time and I can see myself being really happy there. So they were my number one for that. That's a really good answer and a very wholesome answer. Um, yeah. <laughs> ooh, what are you most scared of heading into residency? Mm. <laughs> I hate to say it, but oh... I think that because I'm not afraid of working hard. I'm not afraid of losing sleep. Um, I think being my parents are still living here in Southern California. I think being isolated away from them um, for I don't know if they're going to follow me at some point. I think they plan to. But um, being isolated, um, finding a partner is also like a something that I'm really scared of. And I know that's like unrelated to residency, but um, it's life. Yeah, like yeah, you're going to be working so much and being in medicine is is really unless you have someone going in, um it's like really not conducive for like healthy close relationships in that way or at least from what I've experienced and so um that worries me because I'm I'm getting older and I have like a timeline that I would like to follow but I know that life doesn't always work like that. Yeah. Those those are all great points and I'm sure like our concerns for many women entering residency right right oh. oh there's obviously i can't i can't speak to it and i'm not i'm not going to because i'll never i'll never understand that uh, but yeah. i i just i don't know how how to navigate it and i don't i don't think it's really a correct way either yeah i just like life will take us where we're supposed to be but it's just trusting that process and being comfortable with the uncertainty um, is something that I've definitely learned to be okay with. Definitely. Ooh. Okay. I got a few like deep ones. Okay. Let's see. Which one do I pick? Ooh. Have you ever felt deeply insecure about your friend's intelligence and how do you overcome it? Ooh. Um, Yes. I think, and not so much now, I mean, even nowadays it happens, but I know that growing up, I was surrounded by people, like kids that I felt were much smarter than I was, and they just could read really fast, they got really good grades in school, and I just didn't know how to learn, I didn't know anything, I was super slow, and 
so I felt terrible about myself for so long and a lot of my insecurities and self-doubt definitely stem from that um, and then it wasn't until I really applied myself that I saw the change um, and so applying yourself and just having confidence I think is important and then now that as an adult and dealing with people who you know have a better application than me they have better scores than me I think that staying in my own lane and not even listening to the background noise it was really helpful Good advice. I, yeah. I think I don't, I don't know if I have a great way to navigate it per se. I, I think this is also coming from the context of just coming out of dedicated and seeing people like getting scores so easily that you have to try so okay. hard for. And, and that's honestly a product of just how great our med school is, our, my classes. We have some brilliant, brilliant people. Um, but it, it is tough like I think for me a lot of a lot of people have their methods of studying a lot of people like group studying reviewing their practice tests with each other mm -hmm. I was in a cave because I was like if I do that I'm going to crumble right. seeing like me working so hard to get like the lowest test score that mm -hmm. like this person has gotten mm -hmm. and so I, I think just knowing that about yourself and like I, I don't necessarily think it was the healthiest thing in the world. I think it swung too far the extreme the other way as far as isolation goes. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely knowing if you do that, like combat it, don't continually put yourself in that situation to mm -hmm. compare yourself. Um, right. And your friends will understand. I, right. I think that's also a big part of it. Right. We're all different as learners. And so accepting our own different learning styles will be the key. Absolutely. And I think... Two more. Okay. Anything you would do differently over your time in med school? Mm. Oh, yeah. I think the first and second year I was too hard on myself where I was too neurotic. And I think that if I cut down my studying time, because I studied too much, I think, and it was kind of self-destructive at some point where I would sacrifice going to the gym or cooking an, a healthy meal for myself and resorting for you know, dino nuggets in the air fryer, which is not bad, but you know, you could make something more nutritious for your body. And so I would sacrifice those moments for myself so I could study more. And I think that cutting out that time wouldn't have changed my scores. And so, um, I, I want you guys to not be too hard on yourselves because life is so short and it's not worth it. It's never worth it to do that, to like kill yourself over, over studying and stuff. Yeah, I, that's pretty similar. One, I, I think for me, I would have definitely taken step one before my clerkships. I think I would have done a lot better on my clerkships if I had that solid fund. Um, that was kind of in part to being the guinea pig of a new curriculum. So I don't, I don't know how much control over that I had. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think I'll probably make, again, this is probably going to be part of the video that I make about um, dedicated, but I truly want to express that the saying med school will take as much as you give it is ridiculously true and right. i i gave it a lot um during my dedicated time and i think it's like in many ways negatively impacted me and i'm still trying to recover parts of myself that i think like that period cracked Right. I want to add on to that because I resonate a lot with it and I've seen it in students where we come in, we have this application, we know who we are as human beings. Of course, we're going to keep growing, but most of us feel very secure with ourselves and our identity when we start med school. And then we get crushed first and second year, even a bit of third year. And then we start to build ourselves back up for, for the rest of third year and fourth year. And then all of a sudden we become whole again. And even I feel like I'm a better version of myself before because of all of the um, challenges that we've been through. But I've noticed that pretty much everyone does this. We crumble and crack and then we have to build back up again. And I, I always tell everyone like it gets better. Like I never believed it, but it does get better. And although we crack and crumble for a bit, you will be stronger afterwards. Oh. Well. I hope so, because I think you will, Andy. Like, I, I'm definitely at the kind of the trough of I that. Know, I'm um, so sorry, but it'll be okay. Again, it I, be I I know it's 
I know it's part of the process and, you know, there's lessons that I had to learn along that, along that way. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, we'll, we'll kind of draw conclusions from it in, in, in a year's time. Mm-hmm. Again, fingers crossed. Uh, and last question for the future OBGYNs, what is your one word of advice? Oh, one word. Okay. I would just say passion. If you're having passion and you just passion pours out of your body for OBGYN, everyone will smell it. They see it and they, they want that. They want people who love what they're doing and OBGYNs want you to love their field just like anyone anyone wants you to Mm. love their field but if you really love it show your passion don't be afraid if it's your number one tell them that they're your number one if you love delivering babies tell everyone tell tell everyone you love doing pap smears and if you really love it and so (laughs) I'm serious like be passionate and don't be shy don't 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 shy away, like let everyone know. And and the environment that you can create when you show others how passionate you are, it's just, it's so much better. And everyone just works better with each other when we're all happy doing what we love to do. That's really, really good advice. Yeah, Um, and don't go, please do not go into OBGYN if you don't love the field, because please, like these are going to be my patients. And I don't want my patients to feel insecure about their bodies, ashamed, um, judged, whatever it is. Like these are very intimate parts of our, of our bodies and really intimate, emotionally charged circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, uh, being very mindful of that is so important. So you really have to be passionate about the field and and respect your patients. Absolutely. And Mm -hmm. I, I think that goes true for any field, but of course, um, yours especially. Um, but that is all I have. Uh, Rachel, thank you so so much uh for taking the time to be on the show and you know i know you're going to do fantastic whether or not by the time this episode comes out you've already started residency um you know you're going to be great um i don't think anybody has to question your passion for the field and i know you're inspiring millions and i i don't say that lightly millions of future obgyns as well my heart. Thank you, Andy. I thought I was going to cry on this episode, but I'm glad that I didn't. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I had so much fun and would love to do this again. Of course. Again, we'll, we'll keep in touch. Yay. Okay. Sounds good. Peace. <laughs>